level of the score team. I'm also helping local I team here uh, okay. back in Istanbul. Um, I'm also pretty interested in like I want to if you I want to talk about AWS, I will be here uh, during the whole day. But today we are going to talk about on call. So my favorite topic. Uh, so before we start, I want to ask you a couple of questions. So are you working in an organization that expects you to be on call? Awesome. So do you think on call sucks? Anyone? Okay. Well. Probably it does suck <laughs> as at a certain point. I agree. I've been on call uh, for more than a year uh, before moving to moving on to evangelism. Um, I've been an engineer for six years again, like before moving moving into this job. And I agree with you, but I think there are a lot of practical solutions that we can uh, we can we can we can apply to reduce the stress and burnout of uh, on call. And why is always more important than what? So I want to start with. Uh, like talking a little bit about why on-call matters first, and then why we're building better on-call practices matters. Next. So first, um, so I could give you like different examples from the biggest cloud providers. Like I have a list of them. Uh, Azure, AWS, Google Cloud, they all fail all the time. You know, they brought the, the bring down the internet with them. Uh, but I want to give you an example from a different um, from a dif from a different example. I want to give you a different example from uh, the service that our lives depend on, 911. So the service that needs to be up and running all the time. And these two examples are from here, United States. Uh, so in 2014, on a June morning in Washington, 911's IT operations manager got a, got a page. So there was someone trying to reach out to 911, but he couldn't. And he was able to reach out by borrowing someone else's phone. And then they realized this happened only for a specific telecom provider, and they tried to reach out to them for hours. They could not. And the problem is only resolved after hours later without response. And in, a, in another incident with 911, just last year, in 2018, um, so emergency cell phone provider just faced even more serious hey, incident. So the I dropped data the sponsor center, because we put the, the, the cloud provider and that these companies, that. these cell, and they really cell don't providers them. use, um, so had a big outage asked, and, and brought like down the 911 minute. calls, um, wireless calls got it to, for over a day, um, and they could not quit. connect. So I'm going to go talk to Optini and, and apologize. So, um, um, sorry, big drops and apologize, and I'm going to slap them in. I we already agreed to this one. Hat, but uh, obviously, if it's not fun if you can't go to the beach without your laptop, if you wake uh, up at 2 a.m. Uh, but there is more to this just, you know, being called during the night. To and there is a research on this. Like research? Uh, the people from the cool. professors Great. from the University um, of Hamburg okay. did a research with 132 uh, people uh, from 13 organizations. And they collected daily survey um, a period of four days during which they were not they were required to be on call outside of business hour and during four days, which they are not, they were not required. And they also collected daily cortisol level samples from 51 of them. And, and the results show that on call, even if there is no alert, on call isn't leisure time. And there are significant effect of uh, extended work availability on the daily start, day of the, uh, daily start of the day mood and cortisol awakening response, you know, the body's stress hormone, main stress hormone. So acknowledging these facts basically helps us invest more, helps us invest more in on-call and take actions to ensure we put enough resources to make on-call better. And as a software industry, we actually became a lot better since the last decade, since the um, foundation of DevOps 10 years ago in Ghent with the DevOps Days conference. So this is 10th year anniversary of DevOps Days. Um, so we started making uh, small iterations, automating a lot of processes using DevOps principles and tooling. And one of the, one of the most important parts is that it comes with the CI-CD solutions, right? So uh, according to a survey that our team uh, did uh, with 500, over 500 people, 57% of teams report fewer outages and bugs uh, after they adopt CI-CD solutions. But there was something different with, with uh, Rainer Vogel saying this sentence basically changed how we operate software today. You built it, you run it. And for us, when we were small at Optini, you know, Optini is not part of Atlassian, but just uh, almost like three and a half years ago, when I joined, we had about 
15 people in the engineering team, only two technical co-founders were on call. So they could, like they knew uh, ins and outs, everything. They could take on the on-call responsibilities. It was all fine. But as we scale the engineering team up to 80 people today, just for the obscene team, it basically didn't work out well. So we started putting developers on call because one of the reasons is they get a lot of alerts because we have now a lot more services. Also, they didn't know a lot of things, uh, all the details anymore. So um, there are different versions of developers on call. As you may know, Site Reliability Engineering follows a slightly different approach. They have developers on call, but for, for only services that are not like extremely super reliable, for services that are stable enough, like they meet their SLOs for a long time, for example, let's say Google Maps meets their SLOs for a long time, the on-call is SRE, SRE's job. But SRE teams have the power to give on-call back to developers if the, those services became less reliable. Doesn't mean if they don't meet, if, if they don't meet their service level objectives. And I think uh, developers on-call is the most important part of this uh, building a healthy on-call culture equation. And there are three, more, three important things uh, that we should be aware of, three, three benefits of putting developers on-call. And the first one is we have like ever increasing demands around availability, reliability, security of our applications. And developers are often the most qualified people who can solve problems the fastest. And the second one is when we talk about DevOps, we usually talk about this. Uh, so basically when we put developers, we remove the conflict in incentives, right? Now everyone is responsible for what is running in production and the outcome is often better testing, documentation, monitoring, and alerting and overall on-call. And the last benefit of uh, developers on-call, I think this is sometimes overlooked, uh, is the alignment between development teams and management. Because it used to be like only a couple of people from operations teams were on-call, so if something happens on production, they were there to blame, and management just you know considered them responsible. But now management can easily see what are the like effects of on-call on the, on the time developers spend, not, not creating new features, but just working on the alerts. They are now able to, now able to like better uh, see the importance of reliability work, so they can prioritize the reliability work easily. So now I wanna share a personal story with you. Uh, this happened about two years ago. Uh, so uh, me and my friend was working on an issue, so it was kind of a big change. So for those of you know, who don't know, Opsgini is an alerting and on-call management solution. And alerting page is kind of important, right? So when you log, on, log into Opsgini, what you see is the alerting page. Uh, so our change basically was about Elasticsearch. Um, I assume like most of you probably use Elasticsearch, right? Uh, but it was not directly like, it was a basically a code change. Uh, but we worked on this issue, like for two weeks, we did all the tests we, we could. So uh, we couldn't wait like until Monday. So it was about like 5.30 p.m. around Friday. Uh, I mean, if you ever remember one thing, <laughs> you don't send changes at 1.30 1 1 uh, p.m. on Friday. Uh, so uh, just the going over the incident. So we could not catch, unfortunately, this problem uh, with automated monitoring. So customers report the problem. There's an inconsistency on UI. They acknowledge the alerts. They they see it's not acknowledged or they close it, they see it's not closed. So the, the page basically retrieves alerts from Elasticsearch. Uh, customers support the problem. So customer success team creates an alert on, from Slack, uh, basically paging the alerting team. Um, so on call checks the Jira issues and sees that like I'm the, we are now sending the feature and adds me as a responder so I get paged as well. And after like 15 minutes of figuring out, by, by figuring out like what is what is wrong with this one. Um, we could not. So we bring in some response team, basically two technical co-founders, three senior engineers. So we started working on the issue. Uh, at this moment, we knew that we had this option called, disable, we had this option to disable a cluster, Elasticsearch cluster. At the, mo at the time we had two clusters. So we were reading um, like whatever the closest region is, we, re we were reading from them, from that one. So we disabled one of the clusters. Obviously this triggered some additional alerts because there were now more loads onto going to do one cluster, but it stopped the problem for new alerts. So after a lot of debugging, uh, we found a bug in the code. Um, 
basically it was about like uh, the the async nature of Elasticsearch. We we did not consider in just one code one part of the code. Uh, we sent the fix, but there were still inconsistencies. So it was about 2 a.m. in the morning. We went back home. We ran the data sync job. We basically fixed all the alert alert states, and we went back home. So as you can imagine, there were a lot of le lessons learned um, from that experience. Now I'm gonna go over uh, them, some of them, but I'm, I'm not just gonna talk about this incident. I'm also gonna talk about some of our successes because we usually miss them, we usually don't, don't talk about them, but talking about them was also important uh, for us to like figure out what can we do better next time. Um, again, like the last, last week, uh, Andrew Kuleshefer was with us in Istanbul. He's always saying, I, I really love uh, his code. You haven't learned anything until you change your behavior. So like you are seeing these, all these lessons learned here, if you don't change anything in your company, it doesn't mean anything. So the first thing I wanna point out is heroism is not sustainable. I mean, if you are just a couple of people in your company that can work until some point, but even Iron Man needs backup, right? So it doesn't scale well. And obviously the, the, the first thing we should do is to start putting developers on code. We already talked about that. And maybe just there are some best practices, like for example, don't put a, an engineer on call more than a week, kind of like improvements in your rotations. But there is, I think, more to this one. So a couple of things uh, I wanna mention here. Uh, you need to make it easy to call for help. So in this case, cu customer success team knew like how to page an on-call team. They didn't need to go to Slack and ask like, who should we call and there's a problem with the alerting page. It was already clear, already written and in a document so they knew like who they need to call. And once the alert is created, the alerting team's on call engineer uh, was able to add me as a responder with just you know selecting my name and I get a call from my preferred notification channel that is also important. They don't need to know who is on call at that point. It's very important and also I suggest you build three, at least three step, uh, ideal three step escalation paths. Yeah, like if alerting team wasn't available because it was a, they knew that it was a high priority alert because they were able to replicate the problem. So the, this escalation was pretty strict. Like if uh, the escalation couldn't reach out to the on-call person, in five minutes it, will pay, it, it would page the whole alerting team, for example, because it was a high priority alert for us. And one of the things uh, that I think we should be talking about is arranging development duties during on-call based on pager load. So we, um, like as we started doing on call with the developer, with, with, with uh, putting developers on call, we decided that uh, half half of their developers' time could they could they will be able to uh, work on the new features, but it didn't work out well for a while. So we decided to basically don't expect them any new feature development, and just you know work on the alerts, improve them, you know just go with, go and talk with the team if needed, uh, just work on basically fixing the operation issues. And this worked out pretty well for some time. Then we back, we, we went back to do uh, developers like spending half of their time on the de feature development. Basically, it is based on your team, based on your maturity level. Uh, you should decide what is best for your team. There is no like one truth, one silver bullet. And one thing I, I suggest is assigning on call temporarily to the engineer who's making the deployment. This is something we didn't do at the time, and and most of the problems we have, we have them because there is a change, right? If, if something changes, there's a better chance that there's gonna be like something broken. And if you assign the on-call temporarily, like 15 minutes, for example, to the engineer, probably if there's an issue, probably he or she knows like how to solve it the best. So uh, the second one is alerting. I mean, alerting can easily become your best friend or worst, worst friend, enemy. Um, so an example comes from here. In 2010, in a hospital here, a patient died after alarms uh, signaling a critical event went unnoticed by 10 nurses. I mean, the reason basically there were too many alerts coming through. They start, started not caring about them anymore. They basically, there is an alert, uh, it's probably false one, they, they basically skip that. And uh, they turn off the alerts and there were a lot of unnoticed alerts. So the result was a patient dying. I mean, it doesn't have to be this way, uh, like, like someone dying, but obviously 
our apps are important for our business. You know, they, they basically, uh, what, what we are doing this job. So they're also pretty important. That is why we need to proactively fight against the alert that you get. And my suggestion is like no alert is better than a lot of alerts. So if you are getting like a lot of alerts, get rid of all of them and start like creating alerts that actually, uh, that are actually important for you. And make the distinction between tickets and alerts very clear because like if like a failing backup job doesn't mean anything, it, it can wait until morning. So just create a Jira ticket or just you know create an alert if you want to see uh, the, the because it's important for you, if you want to see in the morning, maybe you do that, you create an alert, but don't page the on-call engineer for that alert. And you need to add context on alerts. So uh, in this case, in this uh, example, uh, in this uh, incident, we did not catch the problem with the automatic monitoring. Obviously, uh, you should catch the problems before customer impact uh, if possible. Uh, in this case, we did not, but we usually try to add run books and details sometimes get the logs and attach it back onto the alert so that we reduce the context switch between going through between uh, the logging tool and monitoring tool and alerting tool. And we add like a one click remediation or try actions. We just click like, for example, if you wanna increase the uh, capacity in your, I don't know, at an EC2 instance to your load balancer, you can do it just with one click. You don't need to go into the uh, management console and edit manually, for example. And one of the things uh, we started doing after, uh, after this one was identifying and reviewing repeating alerts. The way we do it, we, we get this data from Opsini and we basically create a, send a message to Slack every day if there is a repeating alert with the, with the mention of the team so they can check if like basically if you wanna remove it, remove it or if you wanna deal with it, deal with it. This is also important. And words matter. So uh, we always talk about blameless postmortems. I'm not gonna just you know, talk about blameless postmortems today. I'm gonna talk about blameless culture. Because thinking about from, for, for example, with this example, if when, when we call the co-founders or senior engineers, if they were to say like, you worked on this for two weeks, how could you miss this? Or something like that, something like a blameful comment, what we call. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's not written on a blameless postmortem, right? So we have to be blame aware and you know, try to avoid it as much as possible. Um, and one time this happened to me as well, like one of the, one of the engineers tried to send this new feature and just you know, two weeks in a row, uh, he caused a part partial outage. Uh, but I, when, when something like that happens, I always think about two things. I always think about why we need to be blameless. And there are, I think, like, again, two things that are most important here. The first one is basically blameful comments help no one. I mean, it will either just uh, cause people to scare of like change, make changes because most of the time, like people who make the changes, they are the ones that are taking the risks. And they might be scared, they might, they might be hiding things, they might be not be willing to work uh, hard enough at, at after some point. So that is why we need to assume good intentions and basically go talk with uh, him or her um, before making public blameful comments. Uh, this might happen even if there is no alert, for example, if like an on-call engineer misses a lot of alerts and you get the alerts like during all night, you might say like this, like, this person is not doing his or her job very well. So you might kind of like feel the, feel the, feel the, feel the blame. So um, in that case, again, just go talk with him or her and uh, you, I, I'm sure you can find a better way. And the second one is people are not the root cause of incident. I mean, just thinking about this huge incident with AWS, you know, S3 bringing down the whole internet with it. I mean, if you read the um, incident postmortem incident report, uh, there is a section an engineer was basically using it wrong flag and basically causing, not, not causing, they're not using that, that uh, blameful <laughs> kind of word, but basically saying an engineer used a different, a wrong flag and it brought down the S3. And apparently that's not the problem. AWS didn't have the necessary checks, didn't automate it very well, all that kind of stuff. So we have to really look at the real uh, issues behind this. And the next one is embracing open or what we call sometimes transparency. I mean, open means um, being vulnerable, transparent, 
willing to fail uh, in front of others. I mean, being open is key to understand, understand and have conversations uh, because sharing knowledge makes everyone smarter. So we need to encourage people to speak up. They might be, they might not feel comfortable like speaking up in a, with, with a lot of people, maybe just talk with them in person, that would be also great. But also like ask everyone in your team uh, whether they are happy with the on-call schedules, whether they are affecting their life, basically talk with them, um, encourage them to speak up. We meet with, uh, within the team like every two weeks just to discuss uh, on-call uh, and alerts specifically. And we need to make information accessible to anyone. I mean, the information it probably like it should be about like on-call policies, for example. Uh, those should be available for anyone to see, anyone to make comments and change, and of course, in a version control system. So uh, some of the questions we should be answering in these policies are, for example, are engineers supposed to be on-call during nights? I mean, we should talk about this before hiring engineers, even like they need to know. Um, or if there is an on-call during night, is there flexibility to work from home uh, the next day or start day later than usual? Or are engineers supposed to be during, like, again, like do the development work during the on-call time or maximum how many times in a month would an engineer be on-call? Questions like these needs to be answered so everyone has a better understanding on how on-call works. So the best way to predict the future is to create it. That is why we need to practice instant response. We need to train our people. We need to uh, do what we can to get them ready for on call. This helps reduce stress a lot. And there are different practices. And the one I really like, I really recommend is shadowing. And in my little call like with 80 people, it's not that big, but um, the results are like, if I ask, do you use shadowing for on call or onboarding? And the result is 46% yes, 46% is what is that. So if they know what shadowing is, they use it. So that is why we need to talk about these practices more and more. Shadowing basically, for those of you who don't know, you put an experienced engineer with an inexperienced new on-call engineer at the same time on call, so they get the same alerts, they start working on the issue at the same time. Uh, ideally, you start doing this during the business hours so they can work together uh, in the same area. That is a lot easier. So it is less stressful for the inexperienced engineer. So they learn together. It's like pair programming. Um, we also have what we call game days. So we can have like a step-by-step -step instructions kind of game um, and people come together and basically simulate a real life incident to try to solve the problem, have a pizza at the end. Um, and also I personally, I'm a fan of podcasts. So I listen to a lot of podcasts. Uh, if you are interested in on-call, you might uh, want to listen to Jay's uh, on-call nightmare podcast. Podcast, It's a great one. Uh, also, we have Atlassian has what we call team playbooks. With team playbooks, basically, you can help, uh, you can measure your team's health uh, about like instant response, on-call. There are different playbooks for different things. I suggest you check them out as well. And one last thing that I think very important, compensate for on-call. I mean, most of the Europe, this is mandatory. I don't think it is in US, uh, but I hear it's becoming more, of, more, more and more like practice in, in our industry. Uh, so compensate for on-call. Uh, we used to do like, uh, I think that's also okay. We used to do like, if for five days of on-call, we give one day off and we don't expect the engineer to work at all, or we, we could just pay for uh, the extra time, especially for the extra time uh, outside of business hours. Uh, this is also possible, and the reason, of course, is the on-call isn't leisure time, as we talked in the beginning. So we talked about seven important things uh, throughout this presentation. I think the key, the real key, is giving developers, basically asking developers to become on-call, so they give them on-call responsibilities, like start paging them, then they feel the pain, they, they start doing better job, and we distribute the responsibilities uh, so we don't basically cause our ops engineers to burn out. And we need to create sustainable rotations and clear escalation paths so people feel safer, people, uh, people can make like changes talking with each other to rotations, uh, so make them available for everyone, uh, be open and share knowledge within the, within the company, within the teams, 
this is also especially important within the team level because they know what is best for them. So if you are thinking about like uh, a strict policy that will like they will uh, be applied throughout your company, if it's a big one, especially it might be a problem. So basically, empower your teams, allow them to like make some deci decisions for them. Uh, also, again, like create a blameless culture, not just postmortems. It is very important. Our words matter. Embrace uh, effective alerting practices uh, and practice incident response. Training is an important part of uh, on call. On call, and finally compensate for on call. And as I told you before, on call by definition is stressful and can lead to uh, stress and burnout for your people. And applying these practices will drive good results in making on call uh, better, help, happier, and healthier for your organization. And I wanna finish my presentation with a real quote that I really like um, from the site reliability workbook from Google. They say, we never achieve reliability at the expense of an on-call engineer's health. Thank you very much. Th thank you so much, Fahad. Um, we, uh, so we have a couple minutes for a question. Who would like to be the first Q&A person? And they should point to get the microphone. Here we go. You said you would um, switch back and forth between having on-call engineers uh, do feature work or just do yep. um, ops work. Yep. Um, did you come up with any kinds of like rule of thumb for like when a team should use which approach? Because I know you had said that like it depends on the team. I mean, it, what we do is if we get a lot of alerts, we talk with the engineers, but also we have reports. So we know like if a team gets a lot of alerts for a certain period of time, how many of them are in which priority level. So if like there's a lot of alerts that are low priority, probably we need to get rid of some of them. And that means like we have to, uh, like we can give some time for the on-call engineer to work on those. Uh, and also we are able to easily see the burn down chart, like on-call basically can't do any feature work at some point. So it's a also a good sign, like after two weeks, uh, after two sprints, they s we see like on-call basically spent all of, uh, all of his or her time basically working on the alerts. That's a good sign for us. And also it's not just, you know, on-call uh, engineer's job. Obviously we don't expect on-call to fix all the alerting problems because it might be something more deep, but we expect on-call to talk with the team and try to figure out the best approach as well for some certain alerts. Yeah. Hey, sir. Uh, hi. hi. Uh, thank you for the session. I actually had two questions. Yeah. First was, what do you guys uh, use for creating your playbooks in office? So there is an escalation. Run books? Or yeah, run okay. books or playbooks yeah. or you know, different names. What right now we keep them in Confluence. Okay. Yeah. Because, because you are Yeah, <laughs> kind of makes sense. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, for now it's Confluence, but there's gonna be a better integration between Confluence and Opsuite. Uh, Confluence and? I missed the second part. Com there's going to be a better integration between Confluence and Opgenie. Okay. Soon, so awesome. you don't need to. But well, for for a lot of followers, we have the run book attached yeah. to the description yeah. directly on the uh, Opgenie. But for like some basically not very critical alerts, okay. we might have a link to the Confluence page as well because it's version controlled. We can just change it, and we just have the link. It's easier to update if like if okay. you have a lot of alerts. And the other question was about automated uh, escalations. Yeah. So there are a few open source and you know licensed tools. Is there any recommendation from your side? Yeah, obscene. Is <laughs> 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 we are really flexible. Awesome. So. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Sure. We have time for one more question. Uh, um. Yeah. So. When talking about alerting culture and just policies around it, when it comes to how an engineer is notified with an alert, letting them define that themselves versus company mandated policies, where do you fall on that and why? Uh, you mean? Uh, like, like first getting a, let's say, push notification, then whether or not you fall back to a phone call or fall back to a text. Oh, okay, so our approach is, so, um, we, we have two things for this one. So we basically give uh, the, we, we will let this, uh, let the on-call engineer choose whatever they want first. But for only high, very high priority, like prior to one level alerts, we have a global notification rule that will call and send SMS <laughs> and send a push notification 
at the same time, for example. Well, we can do that globally, we can enforce this, but our approach is to let engineers do like choose whatever they want. I mean, if they want to get the push notification, they can. If they want to get the SMS, they can. But we know that for certain alerts, we don't want like engineer to misconfigure something. That can also happen, I guess, right? So uh, that's why we have global uh, policies that could change the notifications in Austin. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Serhat. Uh, I just wanted to give Serhat one more round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you.